Good morning. This is the JP Denell podcast, episode one. I'm here with my buddy Lucas. What's up, man? How are What's, you? I'm doing fantastic. Good morning, JP. Uh, it's good. It's a good day. Hey, I just want to say thank you for joining us. Um, this is our first podcast episode, and I just wanted to introduce myself for those that have not heard me on Jocko's podcast or any of the other podcast interviews that I've been blessed and been able to do. My name is JP Denell, uh, originally from Sacramento, California, born and raised. I was actually raised in the same house that my dad grew up in, which is pretty rad. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah, cool. West. I went to the same elementary school that he went to, same high school, had some of the same teachers as him, um, which was awesome. You know, joined the military after high school, grew up playing Navy SEALs, want to be a Navy SEAL ever since I was a little boy, and uh, used to play Navy SEALs with my brother. And my sister was the unfortunate... Um, uh, on the unfortunate receiving end of that because we would tie her up and she would be the hostage that we were going to rescue for missions. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then we would like make her like do missions with us, but you know, it was awesome. I had a really good childhood growing up. Um, all of our family was pretty close, all of our relatives, aunts and uncles and grandparents. Um, you know, I had, uh, both my grand, both my grandfathers served in world war two and my dad's dad was a farmer from Nebraska, which we can – obviously, all these things we're going to dive a lot deeper into yeah, yeah. over the upcoming episodes and over the next however many years we're committed to doing this yeah. podcast, which I guess is until I die, so yeah. that's a long time. Um, but, um, you know, he was a farmer from Nebraska, and World War II kicked off, and, um, you know, he had his mom, my great-grandmother, uh, sign an age waiver so that he could join the military and go serve – my mom's dad flew for the Army Air Corps, um, and so that was the Air Force before it was the Air Force, and he was a pilot and flew the uh, the B-52s, the B-17s, the B-21 bombers, and it was, I mean, just an amazing career. Flew in World War II, the um, Korean War, and Vietnam as well. Mm. Retired uh, with 20-plus years, and then still continued to do work um, for our government and do, did a lot of cool different stuff. He's also a math teacher at a professor. I'm sorry, math professor at a college university in new mexico and um just you know a lot of a lot of really cool stuff that he was able to do over the years because of his service and same thing with my other grandfather so you know that was the root of kind of my childhood was um my grandparents that had served in the military aunts and uncles that had served in the military um, my parents obviously were very patriotic very strong christians as we were growing up and you know my dad uh, wanted to go in the military and um you know it was at a time where recruiting was it was very like like strict and strenuous by time like he was like hey this would be something i'd want to do you know i remember him and my uncle like they're training to like do actually go in and become Navy SEALs. Like they wanted to do that selection program. But, um, you know, at the time there wasn't this big need for it and they weren't able to get the age waivers and, right. and everything else like that. And so that's why, you know, I grew up around was just family members that served in the military and loved our country and supported our country. And then a lot of, uh, you know, some family members, at, you know, in law enforcement and, you know, my dad wanted, um, you know, to become a firefighter. And I remember him like studying and doing all of his stuff to become an EMT and paramedic. And, uh, you know, and again, same thing, like at the time, Sacramento, where I grew up, wasn't hiring a bunch of firefighters. And, and I remember him going through that whole process. And um, it was cool because over the years, I always saw my parents working hard to better themselves and better our situation and mm -hmm. always wanting to do something to serve and and help take care of people, which was really cool. And I think for me, as seeing that as a young boy, um, and the same with my brother and same with my sister, just seeing um, the importance of service to your nation and to, you know, your community and your family. Yeah. And I mean, we're heavily involved in our church. I mean, it wasn't just like, we didn't go to church just on, on Sunday. We were there on Wednesday nights and we would stay, we would go to church service and then we'd serve at all the other like uh, session, uh, services as well. And <clears throat> it was really cool being able to see that growing up. And, and for me, I think just that, that service mindset was probably ingrained into me at a young age because mm -hmm. of the examples that my parents set which was awesome. And, um, you know, I was able to join the military after high school and, you know, I, I, I went, uh, into the Navy to become a Navy SEAL and, you know, we'll talk about that training another time. I, I made it through the training. I didn't quit. Um, you know, I was, I deployed to Iraq twice, Afghanistan once, 
uh, worked for Jocko uh, in Tasky and a Bruiser. So when we deployed to Ramadi in 2006, Chris Kyle was in Charlotte Platoon. I was in Delta Platoon. Leif Babin and I went through SEAL qualification training, all the advanced training yeah, yeah. after BUDS before you go to SEAL training. I went through that training with Leif Babin, Seth Stone, Andrew Poe, all those guys Dang. that were in Tasky and a Bruiser. They were officers in the BUDS class ahead of me. Mm-hmm. So after they graduated BUDS, they went to an officer like uh, – like prep course that they do um, before they go to SQT so they can be properly trained and equipped to lead. Because when you go through SQT, it's the advanced SEAL qualification training after BUDS before you go to a team. And the goal is when you get done with SQT, now this isn't ideal, but the goal is like if you get done with SQT and you check into a team, you are equipped and trained enough to be an asset and not a liability. And you (laughs) could deploy if you had to. Now, obviously – I mean, you, there's a lot more to learn when you check into a SEAL team. I mean, you're constantly, you should be constantly learning over the years while you're in the SEAL teams. And But anyways, that was a separation that allowed me to go through SEAL qualification training with Leif Babin, Seth Stone, and Andrew Paul, which uh, was awesome. You know, I learned yeah. a lot from those guys, you know, and, and so then – Fast forward, we all do a workup and a deployment. I graduate. Well, let me back up. We graduate from SQT. Seth and I, we both go to SEAL Team 3, Delta Platoon. Leif Babin goes to SEAL Team 5. Uh, Andrew goes to another unit that he was helping support. Uh, and then we all do our workup deployment. Leif comes over to SEAL Team 3 into Bravo Platoon. Mm-hmm. And then that's when Jocko came in to be our task unit commander. So Leif is a, the officer in charge of Charlie Platoon. Seth is the officer in charge of Delta Platoon. Chris Kyle, point man, lead sniper in Charlie Platoon. I'm point man, lead sniper in Delta Platoon. Gotcha. So I, I, we're each other's counterparts. And um, so if you've re- if you've read American Sniper or watched American Sniper, you know they're teasing him about the young the young sniper catching up to mm-hmm. him. That was me when I was twenty three in Ramadi. Really? Yes, yes, Dang. yes. So you know, just right place, right time, and yeah. because of the environment, and also because of the support of the team, right? You're not going out there and doing those solo missions. I talked about it once on Jocko's podcast, where it was a rarity. But even then, it wasn't solo. I was with another guy. Yeah. another teammate right where we went out and we did this mission and um <clears throat> but that's even then we still have the support of our team at a distance so you're not going out there doing these solo sniper missions that you watch in movies yeah. i'm sure there are guys that do that i never did any of that right. um and i know that actually there there probably are a lot of those types of missions that have been conducted by other branches and other units and other snipers, which I think is incredible. And I'd love to meet some of those guys one day yeah, and yeah. just hear their story. Um, but that was, that was not the deal for us in Ramadi. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it was awesome to be able to what I do, what I did in the SEAL teams after Ramadi. I started working for Jocko at the training command. So it's called Trade It. Uh, it's a training detachment for all the West Coast SEAL teams. He took over that training. I was in a platoon getting ready to do another workup and deployment and then had surgery. Ended up uh, with some temporary nerve damage after the surgery. So I would randomly drop stuff and my right hand was like super weak. And yeah, which is not obviously a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, because of that, I got pulled from the platoon and went over to BUDS as a BUDS instructor. And that was not a good combo for me. Young, angry JP after Ramadi. I was at this time, I was still 23 years old. <laughs> and, you know, I was supposed to be in a platoon doing a workup and going overseas. And then all of a sudden now it's like, no, you're not going to be able to go do this again. And that's all I wanted to do. So they sent me over to Buds to be a Buds instructor. I turned 24 years old. Uh, you know, I have the surgery and um you know, i'm recovering from surgery and it's just man i was i was so angry i was so mad i was so frustrated uh and i i completely lost sight of what my mission was i was mm-hmm. drinking all the time i uh i sabotaged a marriage that i had at the time you know i was married before my pre before my current wife um and you know I was just not a good human. And I'm sure there's people hopefully that are listening that, you know, not hopefully you can relate in the, in the aspect that you're not being a good person right now, but like, that's the big intent behind this podcast is just to share what I've experienced over my life, 
the lessons that we've learned, right? And what I've been able to learn in the SEAL teams and just from my parents, from family, from friends, from what I do right now at Echelon Front and uh, just to show transparency and, and so that people can understand like, okay, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm dealing with these same problems right now or yeah. I've actually dealt with these same problems and this is what I did to work through it. Or if these problems ever ex enter in their life in the future, they can think back to one of these episodes and be like, wait, hold on. JP and Lucas were talking about this one time. Like, yeah. what what did they talk about? Or, you know, what did they do? And hey, what was that Bible verse that they talked about? Or like when we have guests on here and they're sharing their stories and the lessons that they've learned is like, okay, how do we how do we push forward and and continue moving forward and not allow complacency to creep in? Because we have to yeah. go to war with complacency every single day. And that's that was something that I understood when I was going through SEAL training. Like I understood that, like I had to stay mot I had to stay disciplined. I had to stay, you know, motivated and inspired and, you know, all that stuff comes from within. Like, yeah, you can be motivated and inspired by other people, yeah. but that fades really quickly if you don't have the discipline to do it for yourself every single day. And I would wake up going through training, reminding myself, I get to do this. I get to do this. And now fast forward and it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing for me to say this, but, you know, I come back from my second combat deployment and I'm at Buzz as a Buzz instructor, which is a great opportunity to help our community. Yet I forgot that and I forgot what I get to do every single day. And instead of waking up saying, hey, how can I be the best Buzz instructor to maintain the integrity of our community? How can I help teach and shape these young men that want to be SEALs, how to be the best version of them and how to, you know, come into our community and, and make a difference, right? I didn't, I didn't do that. I was angry. I was mad. I was pissed off because I was being selfish and I lost sight of what my mission was. And my mission at that time, again, was to be a gatekeeper for our community and obviously not allow guys to enter into our community that didn't need to be there. And we had to weed out the ones that, you know, mentally just couldn't handle it because Bud's training is very difficult and very hard. However, it is nothing compared to combat. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, nothing compared to actual hard combat. So if you hear guys that only talk about training and what it was like in training, like they've never seen actual hard combat. If they think hard training is like the hardest thing, if that's the hardest thing they've ever done, then they haven't experienced like true hard combat. They haven't experienced true hard losses yet. And they will, as, as we all know, all of our listeners know, like you don't have to be in combat. You don't have to be a Navy SEAL to experience loss, yeah. to experience heartache and tragedy and, and hard times and hardships. Like I know I, I meet tens of thousands of people every year doing what I do at Echelon Front. And I hear a lot of stories from people that are struggling and going through hard times that aren't Navy SEALs, they're not Green Berets, they're not Rangers, they're not MARSOC, they're not in the, you know, Air Force, Air Force Special Forces, but yet they still experience all those hard times. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm hoping people can get from this podcast is, is as we randomly tell different stories and interview different people, it's like, all right, hey, how can I take that and apply it to what I have going on? And, you know, I, I think as we start off this first episode, the biggest thing I want to reiterate is remembering and understanding what your mission is. Yeah. Because that's what I failed to do when I was a BUDS instructor. When I was in BUDS, I remembered it. When my, uh, when I was in a, it was in the platoons, I remember that for the most part. And we can, we can, we'll, we'll talk about some of those yeah, stories yeah, yeah. where I like let that complacency and laziness creep in. Um, but I think this was like the first major time that it was like a really big impact to who I was as a young man because I was just this angry instructor. And yes, I was doing my job as a buzz instructor, but I wasn't doing what I should have been doing. Does that make sense? Right. Like I was like, all right, doing these things, but I wasn't going above and beyond. I wasn't pouring into these guys. I wasn't, you know, looking at it from a big picture thing. It was all about me being angry and saying, cool, these kids are going to pay. Now, I've met a lot of guys that I put through training and came to the teams. And you know what? Like all the good team guys were like, man, you were a great instructor. I appreciate you being hard on us because that's what they want, right? But I, it, it frustrates me because I know – these guys don't know, but I know I could have been a much better instructor to them. 
I could have actually taught them more. I could have shared more stories with them. I could have, you know, shared lessons so that way they could hold on to those things to where when they were in a platoon, they were overseas and they're going through something, they could like have that, have that knowledge. You know, the SEAL teams are big on, on passing on knowledge and lessons and experience through stories. And, you know, that's what we've been really good at over the years. And it's, it's disappointing that I wasn't doing that. And because I allowed that complacency to creep in, like I said, I, I ruined, I ruined that marriage and, um, you know, I just, I wasn't a good teammate at that time. And I remember Jocko found out about that. He was running training for all the West coast seal teams, like meaning the, the guys are actually in the seal teams. He was running all that training to prepare them for, for combat he found out that I was struggling. I wasn't doing well. It's funny when he talks about on the podcast, he acts like he, he's like, he was like, it was like the John Rambo scene where they call the commanders, like, come get your boy. <laughs> and he's like, he said that a few times. And so he got that, he got that call and, you know, Jocko being the good leader that he is, he took care of me. He protected me. He pulled me over to trade at because he knew that if I was at trade at teaching SEALs what we had learned in combat, then I'd be much more fulfilled. Yeah. And that was the thing that was missing is because because I allowed complacency to creep in and because I didn't uh, take the time to understand what my new mission was as a BUDS instructor, I had no fulfillment. I had no mission. I had no purpose. I was just going through the motions. And then when I went to trade at to be an instructor, I felt instant fulfillment. I felt like I was contributing. I felt like I could actually pass on something that I had this purpose again. Mm -hmm. And again, I wasn't happy to be there. I wanted to be in a platoon and going overseas. And, but I, I had a lot of fun when I was an instructor and I worked for Jocko for a couple of years at that training command. And, you know, um, man, I mean, we could talk every week for a year about all the lessons that I learned from just working for Jocko at trade at, and then working for the other phenomenal leaders that were there, you know, um, Andy stump was there for a little bit. I was, you know, I knew who Andy stump was, um, mm -hmm. in the teams and that guy's a stud, you know, that guy has a phenomenal reputation, a great background. Um, he's a hard charger, you know, um, and what life was doing for all the officers going through that training. So after buds before SQT, remember that officer training I was telling you about? Mm -hmm. Well, after Amadi, life took over that training. Who better, like, per, like who better qualified to do that training yeah. other than Leif and Jocko and Seth? Nobody at that time it was nobody, and and so Jocko took over training, Leif took over that training for all the officers, and Seth was now going to be the task unit commander of that same task unit that we were at SEAL Team Three, and that's why I was really pissed off that I wasn't going to be there because Seth was my big brother, man, and <clears throat> you know we're coming up on the anniversary of of when he passed away. And, um, actually when this podcast is released on Friday, September 29th, you know, it's the day before the anniversary of when Seth passed away, he passed away September 30th, 2017, September 29th, 2006 is when Mikey Monsoor jumped on the grenade on our deployment. Um, you know, just to save the other two teammates that were right next to him on that rooftop. And he absorbed that blast and from the grenade and, and, and fought to stay alive for about 30 minutes before he died due to his mm. wounds. And, you know, he's, he was posthumously awarded the congressional medal of honor for his actions. And, you know, we commissioned a, sh a, a destroyer in his name, but, um, you know, the release of this podcast on the 29th is to me, it's, it's very special because of those two guys yeah. and we'll get into their stories later. Um, you know, today's not the time. Um, it's just, something I want to be very intentional with and, and, and put a lot of real, th a lot of thought and effort into it. Cause I want to make sure we honor those guys. But, you know, Seth was a, he was just a phenomenal human. He was a phenomenal leader. You know, he taught me a lot about servant leadership and to take care of your guys and to show them compassion and love. And, and, you know, he, he did a phenomenal job of that. And, you know, and Leif does that to this day. And so does Jocko. Yeah. And a lot of people, when you think about Jocko, you're like, wait, what? Like, did you say compassion and love? Like the guy looks like a silverback gorilla and a cyborg <laughs> had a baby. <laughs> like he's just like this, you know, like he's just larger than life to a lot of people. Right. But I can tell you right now, um, 
Jocko is one of the most compassionate, caring, loving leaders I've ever worked for because he's always maintained very high standards mm. of himself. And then he expects high standards of the people around him. Like he expects it at the, at, at the absolute top. And when I first experienced that, I realized like, oh, this guy cares about us. And yeah. then now that I'm older, you know, when I first met him, I was 22 years old. I'm 40 years old now, you know? <laughs> I've been working with Leif since I was 19, okay. which is crazy. So 21 years I've been working with Leif uh, and 18 years with with Jocko. Dang. And just, it's it's incredible. But, you know, these guys always having high standards really has shown me over the years how much they, they really cared about me and how they cared about everybody. And, you know... I think that really ties into the whole like understanding your own mission and not allowing complacency to creep in because as humans, we have to have high standards for ourselves as well. Like if you, if you want to achieve success, you have to have high standards. Now the problem with like people saying, Oh, if you want to achieve success, the, like the problem with that is everybody, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say everybody. Most people instantly assume success is a financial thing. I don't believe that to be true because I know a lot of people that make a lot of money and they're miserable. Yeah. Like, okay, cool. You can have all that money, but if you're miserable, if you have a horrible marriage, your kids don't even know who you are. Your kids hate you. They resent you. Can you tell me you're successful? No. And you know, I don't know who said it. I've heard it a few times. This isn't me inventing some new cool saying, but I believe that like success is when you wake up happy. Yeah. Think about that. If I can wake up happy, I'm successful because if I wake up happy, is my marriage doing good? Yep. Do, do my, do I have a good relationship with my kids? Yes. Am I financially stable? Yes. Do I have some extra time freedom to do the things that I like and enjoy? Yes. Do I have good relationships and, and with my friends and people in my community and my family? Yes. Do I get to do recreational things that I enjoy like jujitsu or, you know, going to the gym or, or you know, whatever, or going to the shooting range and doing all, do I have the time to do those things? Yes. You know, if you can, if you can wake up happy, then you're, you're living a successful life. And that's, what's cool is because your definition of happy is going to be different than mine. But as long as you're happy and you're a good human and you're contributing to society and you're taking care of other people, then I think that's what we should strive for. It's it's not a financial number. Like I've made good money. I've had zero no money. Like right. I, I've done, you know, ups and downs. And what's funny is like me saying I've made good money to other people, that's bad money for them. Like, man, that's a, that's a horrible year. Well, okay, cool. <laughs> like we don't have to compare those things. Right. And you know, I know you know this also, like comparison is the ultimate thief of joy. Yeah. When you start sure. comparing yourself to other people, it's, uh, you know, it's, that's not where you want to be. Never. It's not where you want to be. And so, um, you know, I know we kind of went some down some different rabbit holes of this introduction and the purpose, but this is actually how I wanted to start yeah, off. Yeah, for like, sure. I didn't want a super strict, rigid, you know, opener, um, because, that's just not how I like to communicate to people. I like to, you know, before I speak at Echelon Front, I always pray that the Holy Spirit speaks through me. Yeah. And that means I'm going to say things differently every single time I speak because it's whatever, whoever I'm listening to, they need to hear, you know, something different. And it also, I feel, makes it genuine because I'm not saying the same robotic thing over and over and over and over. It's a different thought, a different emotion, you know, talking about something or I see a picture on the slide, it might trigger a different thought from a story. And then I'm, I'm going to go down that, that path because I know that there's a lesson that I can pull from that story that my clients need to hear. Yeah. And so, um, and that our listeners need to hear it now, right? Well, now we're doing the show. I know, I yeah. know. That's what I'm excited about, you know. And, you know, it's funny. It's like I've put this off for <clears throat> almost five years, man. Really? Yeah. So I was on Jocko's podcast in October of 2016. So almost seven years ago. Okay. So this is the first, that's the first episode that I heard. Yes. Like the first ever Jocko episode that I heard after I met you. Yes. It was Jocko podcast episode yep. 46. Yeah. And then I was on 246 and then 309, 376, and then 390. Okay. And then when this pops 
when this podcast drops on Friday the 29th, I'll actually be recording another episode with oh, Jocko. Really? Yeah, I'll be in nice. San Diego. And uh, we're going to be talking about Mikey and Seth and reviewing his new book that's coming out. So that'll be rad. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, so when I first did that episode, um, you know, there was, you know, of course, people are always like, man, when are you going to write a book? And I'm like, never. I have zero <laughs> desire to write a book. And I still feel that way now. Yeah. Again, I never, what I've learned over the years is don't say things that you won't do because when God opens doors and you're being obedient to what God asks you to do and what you, hey, you know what? I might write a book one day. Right. Because if that's what God has intended for me and if if I feel like that's something I need to do to, you know, to deliver impact, then I'll do it. If it's to deliver impact and help people and, and further exposure to the kingdom, then okay. 100%. Yeah. But I'm not going to write a book just to write a book. I don't, I don't have that desire, you know? And also I'm not going to lie, like (laughs) working for Jocko and Leif and the books that they've written, man, they've written some amazing (laughs) books. Like there's not a lot. I mean, you read extreme ownership, dichotomy of leadership, leadership strategy and tactics, you know, discipline equals freedom field manual, all the warrior kid series books that Jocko's written. Like, I don't, man, you look at those books and you're like, I I think that's a lot of good information right there, y'all. But I also understand that I have a different perspective. Right. And I've also experienced different things in life and God has given me um, different tools uh, than Jocko and Leif. And, and that was the other reason why I'm doing the podcast and being obedient now, instead yeah. of putting it off for the last five years, you know, cause I was always just, you know, I was overthinking it. And to be honest, until you and I met because of the Jesus and Jiu-Jitsu podcast that I also helped yeah, be a part of. Which you also go listen to. It's good stuff. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Jesus and Jiu-Jitsu. We're on Instagram, Jesus and Jiu-Jitsu underscore USA. Yeah. Give us a follow. Check out the podcast. It's awesome. Uh, but when I met you or that podcast and how you literally do, you take care of all this. Like we're at your church right now. Yep. You have this studio set up. You do all the recording. You do all the editing. You do all the uploading. You do it all. I'm like. Huh. I remember the first time I heard that about you, and then I came here. I'm like, so you hear it, and you're like, okay. yeah. And then when I came here and experienced it, and then when the stuff started being produced, I was like, oh, well, there's that missing part I've had because yeah. I was always overthinking – how are you going to do it? And you know, what partnership looks right for this? Cause there also like with this podcast, there has to be a, a proper partnership and an right. understanding of like, Hey, this is what we're trying to do. This is what I need help with. You know, Hey, you're good at this. I'm good at this. Okay. Can we work together? Do we have a common understanding? And like, it's been yes, yes, yes. You know, that's why Jocko and, and Echo do so well together with their podcast is because common understandings from the get go right. before they started anything like you and I did. And, also, I, I'm sure, I mean, you're super busy. I'm crazy busy as well. There's a delay on us getting started, but it was also, we were, you and I were still working through understandings on different things. Yeah, Just for sure. because it was like, hey man, I don't want to, I don't want to ruin a friendship. I don't want to make, you right. know what I mean? Like I need to make sure we're on the same page. Yeah, we're not over committing ourselves. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Uh, which it's been awesome that we're able to do this, but you know, it reminds me of, of, of Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Um let me find it real quick. I don't have that one memorized. You're going to have to read that one to yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? You don't? That, that's one of the things about being a pastor where people are like, oh, it's this Bible verse, and they give it to me, and they look at me like I'm supposed to know which one it is. <laughs> like Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. All right. And they're like, you know it. Like, as, I, soon as, I no, it I as soon as I say it. No, I don't. As soon as I say it, you're like, <laughs> probably, yeah, okay, yeah, I know. I know, I know what And so is, actually right? one of my pastors, I go to Milestone Church, and one of my uh, pastors, um, I got a Bible for a buddy who he needed a Bible. Yeah. And I w- actually, we'll talk about his story in the future. His name is Casey. Awesome dude. Lives up in Alaska. Met him at uh, Origins Immersion Jiu-Jitsu Camp last year. Saw him again there this year. Been helping him understand faith and actually understand, like, uh, he, he wants salvation. He wants a relationship with God yeah. and Jesus. But it's just been hard for him to grasp because of his upraising. And I was like, hey, that's actually very understandable. Yeah. <laughs> like, that, like, hey, went just... Keep leaning into God, and when you hear Him, and when you feel Him, and you ha- you feel the presence of God, it's undeniable. Yeah, like you'll feel it. And anyway, so I got him a Bible, and what I wanted to do is I took the Bible with me to church, and then I had all my pastors and friends there like give me a verse, mm-hmm. and I wrote it in there. And one of them, and I've always known this verse, and it's something my family would always talk about a lot. And 
I was talking to my buddy Sal uh, Frisella last night just about business and Little Cattle Co. and Echelon Front and us doing this podcast and the printing company, all the things. And, um, you know, he's a, a very good buddy of mine that I, I get to talk to and I look up to and, you know, we bounce stuff off of each other often. And he has me come and work with his company and his team up there. And, and um, today I, I text him this. I said, hey, this reminds me of our conversation. And yeah. this verse has been given to me multiple times recently. And it's, to me, it reminds me of this like also like, Hey, this is why I just need to do the podcast and trust him. And so it was Proverbs three, five through six, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do. And he will show you which path to take, which I just love. Yeah. I do know that one actually. I was like, (laughs) I know you know this. I know you know this. Um, That's amazing. But um, you know, for me, it was just like, Hey, just do it. Yeah. Like, you know, be default aggressive, take action and just go do it. So, you know, again, I know these are different little rabbit holes as to why we're doing the podcast and the purpose, but, but it's the intro episode, right? Yeah, like people people got to go. know what's going on and why we got here. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm uh, a married, beautiful wife. Uh, her name is Amanda. Uh, we have an awesome marriage. We have awesome kids. We have a 17 year old boy. We have twin daughters that are 11. Um, and you know, I'm just so thankful for just what I have with Amanda and my family. And, uh, I mean, I know we'll get into it in the future, but Amanda and I were divorced for about a year at one point. Wow. And, um, by the grace of God, we had a second chance truly by the grace of God, you know, and, uh, I'm just very thankful that we were able to come back from that and, I mean, it wasn't like a separation. It wasn't like, hey, you're going to go move out. And like, because we had done that a few times, like right. where it'd get really bad and I'd move out and I'd go stay with a buddy in an extra bedroom. And then, you know, after a couple weeks of that, and then you're like, okay, we can make this work or the holidays would bring us back together. But yeah. we were never actually working on our problems. It was just time. We wouldn't address anything. We wouldn't talk about it. We would just shove it away, which is our natural tendency yeah, as humans. Sure. Like the natural tendency as a human is like delayed action. That's why one of the things that we teach at Echelon Front is being default aggressive to go fix your problems. And I wasn't, which is, again is sad. Like these are all the things that I knew in the SEAL teams that helped me be successful. And then when I'm out of the military and I'm out of the SEAL teams, I'm just not doing all those things that I knew to be right in my, in my marriage and in my family. And, you know, it got so bad to the point where she served me divorce papers. And I moved out and I signed them and I gave them back to her and we were just doing our own thing. And now... I will always give credit where credit's due. During that time, she was phenomenal with the kids. It was, hey, if you want to come see the kids, even if it's not your night and you miss them, you want to put them to bed, like you can do that. And there were some nights I just was like, I really wanted to come see the kids. And, you know, she would just be in her bedroom watching TV and I'd be hanging out with the girls in the front living room or hanging yeah. out with Aiden and talk. Yeah, she was. Dude, that's insane. Like um, in, insane in a sense. Of in like, a good way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that that takes so much grace to be able to do I'm that. I'm telling you, man, she is one of the most amazing humans. Like, and anybody that's knows my wife, they know that about her. Like her yeah. heart is <clears throat> it's incredible, man. Like, I don't deserve that woman at all, man. Wow. And yeah, whenever I share that story and tell people about that, people are like, wait, what? I mean, and here's the deal. We did not like each other, obviously. Yeah. She signed me, started me divorce <laughs> papers. She wasn't thrilled with me, homie. Right. You know, she wasn't like, man, this guy's awesome. Right. I don't want to be married anymore. I was being a jerk, man. That's why she served me divorce papers. Like, I was playing the victim card. I was sabotaging our marriage, our family. I was, I was not a good human. Because, again, guess what happened when I got out of the military? Guess what I let creep it back in? complacency yeah i wasn't doing all the things that i was doing when we first got married and or even when we first were dating and then we get married you keep doing all those those things and what happens in marriages and in life in general complacency creeps in well guess what that complacency is it's the devil yeah you let the devil creep into your marriage into your life into your health and your finances and all these things by not by not actually doing what you're supposed to do that's why in ephesians it tells us to put on the armor of god daily not hey on monday put it on And make sure it's good to go through. No, daily. And I wasn't doing those things. 
I wasn't loving on my wife. I wasn't, I was literally violating every law of combat that we teach at Echelon Front. The first one is cover and move, which means teamwork. We weren't acting as a team. Yeah. I was not, I was not thinking about us being a team. Second one is simple. How you communicate needs to be simple, clear, and concise. Every, every marriage that's fallen apart, it's because of communication. Mm hmm. Right, communication is always one of the parts. Not, I'm not saying it's the only issue, but every single thing that falls apart marriages, families, businesses, relationships it's a communication problem. Yeah, 100%. We weren't communicating. And what's an equal part of communication in regards to speaking to people? It's listening. I wasn't listening to her, I wasn't, I didn't have empathy for her, I wasn't showing her compassion and grace. I was being a jerk. Again, I was being a jerk because I was angry. I was mad. I lost sight of my mission. I was playing the victim card because, you know, I missed being in the SEAL teams. It was the best job in the world. I gave the up literally the best job in the world, my dream from childhood for her and the kids, which I'm glad that I did because that was the right decision at that time. Yeah. And I knew that that's why I did it. Nobody made me get out of the military. I did it because it was my choice and I knew it was the right thing. But you allow that complacency to creep in. Mm. And I wasn't treating her the right way. I wasn't talking to her, you know, and then prioritize and execute, which is, you know, I mean, you can understand prioritize and execute. Yeah, like, hey, what sense. problem do you need to be working on? And yeah. the, to break it down to a different thought process is like, hey, what do you need? To, what decision do you need to make right now that has the greatest impact to the mission and solving that current problem? And I wasn't making her a priority. I wasn't making our marriage a priority. It was mm -hmm. just, I was only focused on work, 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 work. And then I started doing MMA as a stress reliever, which was great. I needed to be doing something to help right. with that transition. So training MMA and fighting MMA was awesome, but that was like the number one focused. It, and it was hard, not just on my parent, I'm sorry, not just on Amanda and the kids, but like my in-laws and my parents that lived in Mississippi at the time that were trying to help. Like it was hard on everybody because I was being selfish. Yeah. It was all about me, all about me, all about me. And instead of me thinking about, hey, how do I serve my wife and my kids and how do I take care of them? I wasn't doing any of those things. So obviously when you're not taking care of the priorities, those things start to have problems. They start to fall apart. Yeah. It's like you're driving a vehicle. Check engine light comes on. The check engine light is on for a reason. <laughs> it means, hey, something is not right. Yeah. You need to go get this checked out. So that you can know what the problem is. And then once you understand what the problem is, you fix the problem. And guess what? Your vehicle keeps running and it's fine until the next thing that comes up. Yeah. I wasn't doing any of those things, which is pathetic because guess what I did when I was in the SEAL teams? All that stuff. Yes, I did all <laughs> these things. And I had a somewhat decent career and I had good relationships and friendships and I was able to do pretty cool stuff. And the last one is decentralized command, which is empowering your people to be able to lead and make decisions. And again, it goes back to good communication of, of saying, Hey guys, this is what we're doing. This is why, Hey, how do you think we should do it? And when I, if you work for me and I say, Hey, how do you think we should do this? Lucas, what am I giving you? I'm giving you ownership. I'm yeah. literally giving you ownership and buy into what we're doing. Guess what I was not doing in my marriage. I wasn't doing any of that. I wasn't saying, Hey honey, what do you think we should do? It was like, Hey, this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. There was no why behind it. It was like, what, 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 what? It was only, this is what we're doing. And again, because I was angry, I, I lost sight of like the vision of my marriage and I allowed the devil to creep in and, and create a lot of division between us. A lot, yeah. there's a lot of, a lot of nights going back, going to bed, literally laying next to each other and not saying one word and waking up, not saying one word <laughs> going throughout the day at work, just not not texting, not calling, not saying I'm sorry, coming home from work, doing my thing with the kids, her doing her thing with the kids. And, you know, she's being loving and like with the kids, which that's what parents should do. Right. Yeah. And I would take that as a, an attack against me that she, I, in my brain would start to think, oh, she's trying to act like she's a better mom than I am a dad. And that would cause resentment, which I say these things and it's wow, ridiculous, man. like ridiculous. Yeah. That's how bad it got, man. Yeah, because I let that complacency and that anger and that resentment take root in my heart, and mm. it got to the point where it was so bad that boom, serve me divorce papers, and signed them, moved out, and again, you know, she was an awesome person and would let me come do my thing and hang out with the kids, and 
it was about a year later, um, I was getting the kids ready for church and I had her on speakerphone and I was braiding Cora's hair and, um, oh, sorry. And, um, she says, Hey, Hey girls, do you want daddy to pick me up for church? I was so mad, bro. I was so <laughs> mad when she said that because we had done the back and forth thing multiple yeah. times, and I just I didn't want to keep doing it. You know, I had read Extreme Ownership, and I was trying to really focus and on myself and get myself back where I needed to be and be a better human. I want to be a better dad. I wanted to be a better actual friend to her because I realized, like, hey, at the end of the day, like we're doing this parenting thing with each other, and you gotta so be able to get along. we got to yeah, yeah, we got to be able to get along. You know, and and so I was really working on just being a better human. And when I read extreme ownership, it was liberating because I realized I was the common denominator in every single problem. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, you moron. <laughs> You're an <laughs> actual moron. And so, but it still didn't, fully help because it's a process man just because you yeah. read extreme ownership doesn't mean that you're gonna it's not like this like you read extreme ownership or you listen to the audio version is like boom better leader better human no you actually have to be intentional with working on those things mm -hmm. and i was intentionally working on some of the things not all the things yeah so i still had the anger and resentment towards her i'm all pissed off she says that and i'm like all right you have like seven minutes to be ready you know, because I'll be leaving the house in two. We live five minutes away from each other. So I'm get, I get the girls into my truck, <clears throat> and I'm driving back towards um, where she lived, where we used to live together. And I remember turning off the main road, and I turn left, and then I make an immediate right. And as soon as I, as soon as I cross around the corner, she's standing outside, and she looks gorgeous, bro. And I'm like, dang it. Like, I'm actually legitimately mad at how good she looks. <laughs> like, I'm so frustrated. And, I mean, my wife is a smoke show. You look at my wife and you're like, that don't make sense. <laughs> like, the two of you guys together does not make sense. Yeah. I clearly had some sales skills back in the day. Yeah. I closed that deal. Like, you know, I think that's why I did good doing sales in the fi uh, in the financial industry for yeah, a while yeah. in between um, what I do now, leaving the teams. But all joking aside, I mean, <clears throat> you know, she just looked gorgeous and... Um, and I still loved her. You know, it was still in the bottom of my heart. I still right. loved her, you know, and I knew that. And um, so she gets in the truck, and she's like, "You look nice." I said, "Thanks." I didn't say anything to her, bro. <laughs> I'm such a jerk. Thanks. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> like, yeah. I should have been like, I know. Anyways, so we go to church. <clears throat> we get the kids checked in to um to daycare, and we're sitting next to each other at church. And we're listening to the message and the pastor is talking about letting go of anger and resentment in your heart. What a coincidence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you've got to be kidding me right now. All right. Hmm. And I'm just sitting there and I'm listening. Again, I had read extreme ownership. So guess what? I'm more open to listening to these things that I know I need to be listening to. And um, she writes on a piece of paper, a little note that says, I still love you and hands it to me. And I fold it up and I give it back to her. And I don't acknowledge it. I don't say anything. Cause I'm, again, I'm so pissed. And you know, it's, it's funny. Like I've told this story to people and people like kind of look at me like, dude, what? And I, I have to reiterate to them like, Hey, I had opened doors that allowed like the devil to creep in. Yeah. I still had a lot of anger and resentment in my heart. Anger does not come from the Lord. Right. Like that does, you know what I mean? That is not, that is. And, and so I had a lot of anger in my heart and I had, I had not fully submitted that anger and given it up to God and asked him to help me like, Hey, remove this anger, remove this, you know, all this resentment and this bitterness that was, is like, my heart was like, it was like hardened, like concrete mm. now because of leaning into God, the little bit that I had started to and going back to church and reading extreme ownership, like my heart was starting to crack up, right? Like that concrete was breaking up and it was becoming a little more brittle. Yeah. And, but at the time it wasn't where it needed to be. <clears throat> so even though she's looking absolutely gorgeous, she's wanting to be there. She gives me a note that says, I still love you. I still had all that anger and resentment and hardness in my heart. And I look at it. I fold it up, crinkle it up, whatever. She says crinkle it up. I think I folded it up. Whatever. She's probably right. Right. Yeah, yeah. We'll just default to her being right. Yeah. And so I hand it back to her. And then our pastor's talking. This is back in North Mississippi, in South mm -hmm. Haven, Mississippi. Okay. So 
um, he starts talking about these small groups that the church has. And um, the, they were small groups for couples that were working through stuff and had problems. Yeah. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> and all the coincidences. Yeah, yeah, all, yeah. yeah. And then so she um, says, we should we should do one of those. And I'm like, we're not married. <laughs> like, again. <laughs> and th- but then I realized, I'm like, okay. And, we're, and Amanda's like, there's a lot more of the story. Like, she's obviously yeah. being very influential towards me and, like, listening and, and talking and isn't, like, being confrontational, which, you know, there's so many lessons in that alone. Yeah. How she handled me being a you know, slightly a jerk to her. And so anyways, we go out and we're talking to the counter, uh, like this little counter area about the small groups. And one of the pastors, pastor Tim comes up and he goes, Hey, can, how can I help you guys? And a manager straight up was like, Hey, uh, we're actually divorced. Um, and we're thinking about doing one of these small groups. And this is our last, this is our last ditch effort to see if like we can save our family. Yeah. Wow. Because that's what we had talked about before we walked up. We we had both said like, okay, hey, if we do this and we fully commit to it and we we both do this, if it doesn't work, then we'll know that we've done everything. Yeah. And then we'll just focus on being best friends and you know what I mean? Like we'll just do we'll, yeah, we'll just do out. life, right? We'll be yeah. a, we'll just work very well together. And you know, so she tells him he gets like red faced, like, ah. Uh, yeah, that's got to be awkward. Yeah, he goes. Uh, Erica and Donald are amazing. They're amazing. They're they're actually both they're both marriage counselors. They have an awesome small group. You guys should be with them. And yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. So we sign up for Erica and Donald's group. Nobody knows that we're divorced until we find out later that Erica and Donald knew because Pastor Tim, being the good pastor, goes, "Hey guys, this couple mm-hmm. that just signed up, they're actually divorced, and they don't know if they're going to make this work." Yeah. And so anyway, we did that small group. And when we did a small group, again, we were still having problems. We'd still argue. We'd still fight. There, the devil was trying to creep in because now we're we're trying to like get our marriage back. Yeah. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. Because he doesn't want that because that's how he weakens Christians. And that's how he weakens this nation is, you know, if we have failed marriages and broken families, mm-hmm. it affects our nation and it makes us not as strong as we could be. Right. Because when we don't have that family and, um, you know, in and so, again, that's another thing that I know we'll go into deeper in the yeah, future yeah. that I look forward to. But it was just one of those things where this small group was absolutely incredible because God designed it like, and I know it wasn't just for us, it was for everybody, but for us, it was perfect that we were part of it because all the couples in there were awesome. They're all having like, some of them were having problems. Some of them weren't. They were just there to support the couples that were having problems. And really, yeah, it was incredible, man. Like couples that literally had almost no problems in their marriage still did it so that they could be embedded in the groups to help to be a resource and say, you know, and just open up their homes and we could have extra converse. It was incredible. It's such a good tactic. It's incredible. Yeah. (laughs) It's incredible. And it just shows the heart of these people, you know, and uh, like a man and I are always, you know, just so thankful to that church that we were going to back in Mississippi and to our pastor and especially pastor Tim and, you know, and Erica and Donald, you know, homes that everything that they did for us. And, and, uh, and so like a year later, we, we got our marriage back together, man. We got our family back together and it was incredible. And, you know, it was, wow. it was hard and there's still work to be done, but yeah. I mean, it's incredible what we were able to do because of us understanding, Hey, you know what, <clears throat> if we're going to do this, we have to make a full commitment. Yeah. Now, Amanda also read extreme ownership. She read it on her own. Um, I was continuously diving back into that and we were, you know, putting each other first and our family first. And, you know, it was, it was awesome, man, what we were able to do, because I know a lot of people can't come back from a divorce. Yeah. And, you know, we were able to do it because we made a commitment to each other. And I'm super thankful for that second chance. Mm -hmm. I'm obviously very thankful for Amanda's unconditional love. And, you know, even all all the times that I continue to screw up over the years and, you know, she's, you know, she's my teammate, man. And we're doing, we're doing life together, which is cool. And, um, you know, there's nobody else I'd rather do it with. And she's a rock star. And, you know, so I'm thankful for that. I have that opportunity. And, you know, I'm obviously very thankful for what I get to do at Echelon Front. You know, I'm our chief training officer now, which is crazy. You think about almost seven years ago, you know, I went to the first muster that Jocko and Life were doing and they brought me out there to just see what was going on. And they're like, hey, you know, we're growing and expanding. We, we 
probably need another instructor. Like you should come check it out. So I went and saw this two day leadership event that they're hosting that individuals and small groups and large groups, you know, if you wanted could sign up and come, come to, and they created the muster so that if somebody wanted to work with Jocko and Leif, but they didn't have a large company or they didn't have the budget to bring them out. They could come to this two day event and just, yeah. you know, get the same principles. And I went out to that. And I mean, at the end of like the first 30 minutes, bro, I was like, I'm all in yeah. like whatever these guys need. And, um, that was a really cool story that again, we'll talk about again in the future of like how I made my way out there. Jocko didn't know, like I had zero money zero money to go out there but i was able to somehow make my way out there and i had a buddy steve arian who i was teaching long range shooting with and i was already committed to helping him teach a course and i was like hey man i got this opportunity to go out to san diego to see what jock and life are doing and maybe come on board their team and again like a good friend and just a good human he goes dude that's your priority he goes hey Anything that you want to work with me, awesome. But you got to leave, leave. I'll find another instructor. Yeah. And it was just really cool how, I mean, he could have been like, bro, you're committed to this. Like, hey, you need to be teaching this course with me and these guys. But if you don't do this, you're done. Yeah. Or, yeah. hey, you'll never work with, or, you know, there could have been that where he's like, right. yeah, cool, cool, man. Yeah, go ahead. And then I never did anything with him again. It wasn't the case. He's a good human. He's a good, he's a good friend. Yeah. And, you know, so I'm very thankful that Steve helped me, you know, do that as well. And, um, and, you know, obviously his partner, Greg, um, you know, helped facilitate all that, but it was, it was really cool. Just me being able to go out to San Diego and see the muster. And I was, man, I was fully committed. Yeah. And, you know, Jocko had me on his podcast and then the next week I'm talking with him and Leif and, you know, he goes, Hey, man, nobody knows who you are. Right. And there isn't a demand for you. So I don't know what this looks like. Yeah. He's like, nobody's calling National on Front booking JP to know. They're looking for Jocko. They're looking for Leif because of the book and what we've done. They're like, but if we're booked up or they can't afford us or, you know, it just doesn't work with our schedule, like, you'll be that that option if you're okay with that. I'm like, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm okay with this. This is awesome. And I, and I understood, like, what they did at that point in time, like, they had their table, right? The Echelon Front table. And they put a chair there and they're like, Hey, if you want this chair, it's yours. What I realized is that chair didn't have my name on it. I had to earn that chair every single day Yeah, because that chair could easily be taken away. It could go to somebody else. And there's a lot of other people that are more qualified than me to come be an instructor at Echelon Front. And I knew that. Yeah. And I know that. And for me, it was another God giving me an opportunity and it was for me to take advantage of. Like I had to take advantage of it and I had to, again, going back to Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, I didn't have to fully understand it. I, I still doubted myself. I still questioned it. But I trusted Jocko, I trusted Leif, and I trusted Amanda. Because when I talked to Amanda about it, she goes, hey, they're not bringing you on board as a charity thing. Yeah, Like they can bring on a lot of other people. They're doing it because they trust you. And what I didn't f know at the time, and I think it was podcast it was either 246 or 309 Jocko talks about it, and I never knew this he talks about how Seth had actually reached out to Jocko and was just like hey man I think JP could use some help yeah it's 246 it was 246 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was 246 and you know it's weird that he didn't mention that in you know I say it's weird I think it's interesting he didn't mention that in y'all's first podcast because he had reached out to him like right prior to that. And mm -hmm. then it's 200 episodes later is when he like reveals that once you're embedded yeah. into it. Yeah. So well, cool. yeah, because 246 is we went deeper into like the struggles and Jocko yeah. didn't know I was delivering pizzas and going door to door, knocking on people's houses saying, hey, do you want your address spray painted on your curb so that first responders can see it in case you have to call 911 and, you know, doing construction for my landlord and to offset my rent and then driving up to Nashville and doing instruction for my other buddy who he probably didn't need me to be working but he gave me the opportunity yeah. and it was just all these again blessing 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 that god gave me and he didn't know about all that right because i also on, he gets on to you in that episode well, for not telling him about that yeah <laughs> well do i mean that's my responsibility i'm a grown yeah. man i'm a grown man that it's caused the same, all these it's the problems. same way that like if i was doing all that stuff and didn't let you know oh, like I'd you'd be, be on me I'd yeah, be like, yeah you'd be upset what are you talking about right like, yeah. And that's, a, so that 
Okay. You just bring me some little cattle co beef and be like, here's here's your meals for the week. Here this you go. You, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, exactly let's right. go, yeah. bro. You know, and um, I, yeah, I 100% I would. Right. So on that note, I know, remind me, we'll get back to where I was going with the story with yeah, all yeah. this stuff, but that's why also recently I've been really, really, really trying to be better at fully listening to the prompts of the Holy Spirit and what God puts on my heart because there's a lot of times that, God will put something on my heart that normally I just be like, oh, okay. But the Bible tells us to do what? Take every thought, every thought captive. Yeah. I haven't been doing that my whole life. And I'm trying to be more intentional with it now because it's like, hold on. Wait, why? Why am I thinking that? Right? Or why did that person say this a certain way that prompted this thought? Just be obedient. Like my, uh, one of my pastors at Milestone, Tyron, who is. I can't wait to have him as we will have him as a guest Good. multiple yeah, yeah. times. The guy's phenomenal. His testimony is ridiculous. But um he um he tells me that, hey, you know, if God tells me if I feel like God tells me to do something, I do it. I don't question it. He goes, I've given away so many vehicles because God put it on my heart and it didn't make sense. But then when we gave it to those these people, it made all the sense in the world. And then yeah. God got God gave it back to me tenfold. You're right. And you're like, that's incredible. And you, mm-hmm. you know, you don't want to be giving things to people or tithing because you're like, oh, I want to get it back, you know, right. X, X amount. You do it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, because you're being obedient. Yeah, and yeah. that's, again, going back to like trying to be better humans is a, ma- a big thing Amanda and I did is with our tithing, I'd always tithe for the most part. Like, mm-hmm. hey, you know you're supposed to. It's in the Bible. But I remember one of, the, um, uh, one of our pastors back in Mississippi was talking about this. You tithe as an act of worship. Yep. And I was like, hmm. And so when we started tithing as an act of worship, that was a game changer for, mm-hmm. now, I'm not saying game changer financially. Now things did change financially sure. for us in a positive way, but I'm saying game changer in our marriage, just everything, yeah. everything bro, like started to really get a lot better. And, and, and so that's something I'm trying to be more mindful of like, okay, all right, Lord, I'm, I need to be listening to you. And, you know, I can't listen to them if I'm not putting on the armor of God in the, every single day. And I, hey, I fail at this constantly. I'm not, yeah. I don't want anybody listening to this thinking that I'm thinking like, man, I, I got my stuff figured out and squared away. Like, I don't. I have some things figured out. I'm yeah. kind of squared away sometimes, <laughs> but, you know, I'm a constant work in progress. I am a majorly flawed human. Right. And luckily, I have the grace of God. Right, yeah. that I'm saved by, and I, I have these second chances and third chances and fourth chances, and you try mm-hmm. not to keep pushing that envelope. But that for us has been something that's really helped us out. Yeah, and um, and and it's funny because I've been able to also share this. Not funny. It's awesome because I get to share this on Jocko's podcast. Yeah, and you know, and so that's that's how the door of Echelon Front opened is. I had this opportunity. I was also reaching out to Jocko and saying, hey, if there's anything I can help with, let me know. It wa- I wanted to be of value to Jocko and Leif because they were t- just a phenomenal leaders that I got to work for. Yeah. Phenomenal leaders. They're the leaders that you would go do anything. Anything they ask you to go do, you're going to go do. Yeah. Because you know that they have your best intention. Yeah. They're not asking you to do something for their own personal gain. It's if they ask me to go do something, it's because it's going to help the team. And that's what I always knew about them. Right. And so when I had the opportunity just to come help and be a part of Echelon Front, I, I was all in. And Amanda was all in. And we made this commitment together as a family uh, of like, hey, there's going to be a lot of sacrifice. I mean, you know, my schedule is kind of crazy. It's still crazy. Yeah. But oh, Jocko, sure. but Jocko told me that he told Amanda and I that, that, Hey, for the next five to seven years, or it was originally it was like, Hey, for the next three to five, maybe up to seven years, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be nonstop. But if you want it, it's yours. And I also knew what that meant. That meant that I would be a part of the growth of this company, which meant, you know, as the company grows, and, and now I'm one of our executive leadership, on the executive leadership team at Echelon Front. I'm our chief training officer now. And it, originally, I came on board to give keynotes and half-day workshops randomly when yeah. it was needed. And there was nothing consistent at the beginning. But again, God continued to open doors, and Echelon Front grew. Dave Burke came on board. Dave Burke, I, I was talking about this on Extreme Ownership Academy the other day. Dave Burke is one of my best friends. I've learned so much from him. I literally could write a book just about the lessons I've learned from Dave and the impact he's had over my life. You know, 23 years in the Marine Corps as an officer, Mm -hmm. Top Gun pilot, ran Top Gun school, 
was with us in Ramadi as a Marine liaison for all the air stuff, right? Didn't have to be there. His career, like, he didn't need to be there, but he volunteered to go there. I'm so thankful that he did that because of the connection that we now yeah. have. And that's why he's now on Echelon Front because he stayed in contact with Leif and Jock over the years. I mean, he's the only human that's flown the F-16, the F-18, the F-22, and the F-35 operationally and commanded those units. Whoa. That's impressive. He's the only one. He's the only one. I did a gig recently with Lockheed Martin, and Dave was in town, so we went and did it together because yeah. that only makes sense. Like right. yeah, Dave for sure. Bird, right? Yeah. And it was with guys that worked with the F-35, and it was incredible. Like, like his reputation there because of who he is. I didn't even know this, but he also was one of the guys that helped save the F-35 program. They were going to ditch it. I didn't know this. I don't know if you knew this. or no, I'm, This is my first time hearing Yes. Yeah. So when we get Dave on the podcast, I really want him to dive into this because it's phenomenal. Talk about influence and leading up the chain of command. Yeah. Like what he did was incredible because he built really good relationships. He's really good at communicating and he's really good at his job. Yeah. Just think about all that leadership capital that he had built up. So they're talking about, and I might be getting this completely wrong. I don't think I am because we just talked about it, but you know, I have TBI brain, so whatever. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so okay. Dave is telling me that like, Hey, they were getting ready to scrap the program. Yeah. And he was like, no, 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 This is why we need this program. This is what it's going to be. Blah, 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 blah. That like goes and does this like, um, I don't know. He goes and talks with a group of people. Right. And um, like lobbies towards the F F-35 program. And they're like, all right. And then he gets to run that command for That's that program. <laughs> like how insane is that? And it's just really cool. Like, and I've been working with him for the last six years, man. Think of like just having Jocko and Leif and Dave Burke and Jamie Cochran, who is now our chief operations officer. Yeah. When she was hired, she was hired part-time to book travel for Jocko and Leif. And now she runs our company. Talk about the power of extreme ownership and yeah. living and implementing these leadership principles. It's just incredible. Like what I've been able to learn from those guys over the year and this, that team and, and just what I, what I get to do. And it goes back to this mindset of like, I get to do this. Like yeah. I had that in buds. I get to do this. I had that in combat and training. I get to do this. And it's every time I've ever forgot to remind myself of I get to do this, that's when things in my life struggle yeah. because I allow that complacency to creep in. I'm not thankful for what I have, and which is sad that I allow that to happen because that's not how my parents raised me. My parents never played the victim card when we were growing up, right. never. They always worked really hard. Sometimes they had to work two jobs because that's just, that's just life. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't know many people that haven't had to have a few things going on at certain periods of their life. Right. M you know, the majority of people have at least had a season in their life where it's like, Hey, I had two jobs or Hey, I had three jobs. Right. Yeah. And there was times that my, you know, my dad would be working two jobs and, or my mom would have a job in addition to taking care of all the kids and the family. And my dad had two jobs. And I always looked at that as like, man, like they work hard. Yeah. <laughs> like my parents are hard workers and they always taught us like you can make excuses or you can make things happen. You can't do both. Mm. Which one is it going to be? Are you going to play the victim card? Or are you going to go out there and get to work? And I, I saw my dad day after day after day after day who would get up every morning. And there was times that he'd be coughing up blood with pneumonia because he was sick and it was a winter time. And he'd still go frame houses for 12, 15 hours a day Dang. to make money for our family. And there was times that my mom would eat leftovers because she wanted to make sure that my dad and the kids got fed and then whatever was eaten, she would eat. Mm. And I'm just so thankful for that's, you know, was the base of like who I am as yeah. a human. And again, I'm, I'm a flawed man. I'm not saying I'm this great example to look up to, but I, I have these things that I get to look back to from my parents, from my grandparents, from my brother, my sister, aunts and uncles that, I think back to, and I'm like, man, I'm thankful that I had their influence in my life so that I can refer back to those things and know what I need to do. And it's, you know, I know you as a pastor, you know, like that's why we've been given the Bible. Yeah, for like, sure. This man. is, Hey, here's your field manual to life. Right. Like the answers are, are, are right here. Yeah. Just, you got to seek it. You got to find it. And that's, what's cool about going to church is because 
that's when you have pastors like, like you and the pastors that I have in my church that are like, Hey, here's these things that you need to be aware of. Here's yeah. the things that you need to think about, you know, and that's why it's important that people are in church. And, uh, because then you get to hear a different way or the Holy Spirit's going to speak something differently to you. And it's also important to be in the Bible and, and be mindful of those things. And, you know, that's what my parents taught me growing yeah. up and my, my grandparents, my grandmother's still alive. I only have one grandparent alive. It's my, my dad's mom. She is the closest thing to an angel. I think that's possible <laughs> on, on, and everyone that's ever met her and, and knows her says the exact same thing. Yeah. And, you know, she, you know, wakes up every day and she has done this her whole adult life and prays for every single family member. That's impressive, man. I mean, you know, it's just, you know, and, and it's cool to like, I think back and it's just like, man, like, is that the way my grand, my grandkids are going to think about Amanda and I one day? I hope so. Yeah. You know, is that how our kids are going to think about us? I hope so. You know, and, and that means that I've, I've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. And. You know, and that's also, I think I stay so busy and it's just the thought of us doing this podcast. Some people are like, bro, you're crazy. You don't have time. And I would correct them and say, I do when it's a priority. Yeah. And there are things that I don't make time for because it's just not a priority. And that's not a, a dig on those things or those people, but there's this like point in my life right now where I just need to be ultra focused on things that are going to help me move forward in regards to stability for my family um you know the different businesses that i'm a part of little cattle co on the path printing mm -hmm. what i do to help with origin and jocko fuel but my main focus is always going to be echelon front yeah that is my main focus because of the impact that we deliver but also because i know that it's what god has designed for me to be doing yeah it is clear it is so clear what I get to do with Echelon Front and the opportunity that Jocko and Leif has given me. And that's the other thing that I want people to really understand from this podcast. This isn't me just doing a podcast to do a podcast to be like Jocko or Joe Rogan or Sean Ryan or Andy Frisella or any of these other great platforms that are out there. Right. It's to provide value to bring it back to what we do at Echelon Front. Yeah. Because if it wasn't for what we did at Echelon Front, there'd be a lot of companies that would be hurting. There'd be a lot of people. There'd be a lot of marriages that wouldn't be restored because, you know, we have an event coming up in October here in Dallas and it's called it's the muster, right? And it's already, it's been sold out for a while. And I, I always share, and I think I will still continue to share this in this next one, but about, you know, my mission and la losing sight of that. Mm hmm and I always share the, the marriage story that I shared earlier. Now it's yeah. a much more condensed version of it. And every muster that I've shared that story at, I have at least one person or one couple that comes up to me and says, thank you for sharing that. I'm going to fight for my marriage now. Yeah. So, so like how many musters have you shared that at you think? Cause what, what muster will this be in October? This will be 17, I believe. Okay. Yeah. And you've been at all of them. I've been at everyone. I've spoken at everyone but the first one. Okay, so you've probably shared that story at, at what, 15 or 16 musters? I think it's 13 because I didn't okay. share it at some of them, but I would I would actually share it with companies that I worked for. Right. So since 2017, I have shared that story easily. I mean, I mean, between podcasts and conversations and people that I've worked with, I mean easily five to 700 times. Yeah. And and that's like looking just at the musters, like that's 13 couples whose marriages are like yeah. dramatically different because you had the courage. And to those are the story. people that came up yeah, to they, me they and just came up and talked to you, about you know? about it, right? And the muster that we have in Dallas, like here's the other thing, like I get to share like the grace that God's given me and that yeah. story to a thousand people. That's, a, that's crazy. I, I, I give a keynote in Brazil to 15,000 people that heard me talk about God and restoring my marriage through his grace and extreme ownership. That's so cool. Which is pretty awesome. Yeah. So again, always bringing this back to like what I get to do at Echelon Front and right. the lessons that I've learned. And that's the other cool thing is like, you know, Dave and uh, Dave Burke and Jocko have a podcast that they do called The Debrief. Mm -hmm. If you're not listening to that, you should listen to that podcast. It's yeah. phenomenal. And I'm not trying to copy or emulate that, but I see the value there and it's like, all right, cool. Hey, if I can share some stories from that, I learned from clients and, and Hey, what, what they've worked through and, and, and we can dive into those things and it's a different group of listeners. Cool. Like, let's go. Cause yeah. right now the world needs leadership more than ever. No doubt. I, I and that's not a one sided political statement, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't care where you sit politically. 
I know that we can all agree that our nation needs leadership more than ever. Right. All the way from the top down to the current levels that we're at. And yeah. so if we can help people um, through stories and lessons that we've learned and, and, you know, and diving into the Bible and diving into what we do at Echelon Front and my life experiences and our guests and yours, then that's going to be a win for me, man. Yeah, for sure. And like you said, you know, the, the perspective is what changes everything. Like yeah. there may be some stories that people connect with because Jocko told them or, or Leif told them, but your perspective, your stories are going to connect maybe with some of the same people, but with a different group of people that, that see those things and go to them. Do you think, you know, kind of circling back, do you think that your upbringing, like seeing the struggle that your parents went through was part of why you didn't tell Jocko that you were having all this struggle? Cause you said whenever he found out he was upset, right? He talks about that on the podcast, <laughs> yeah, right? He was frustrated. But do you think that like seeing your parents go through that, you're like, no, this is my thing. We're going to figure out how to get over it. I've seen my parents work through this. And so like, I can too. Yeah. 100%. And yeah. you know, and, and I want to be clear, like when we, like struggle is like we've all dealt with struggle. We're all right. struggling different things. It wasn't struggling because they're like, oh, they couldn't figure it out. No, right. it was, hey man, you're just working through some hard times. Yeah, and and that's what I, yeah, absolutely. You know, I saw my my dad and my mom always working and pushing forward. Yeah, that, that's what they're always doing, and they always remain faithful to God. They never played the victim card. They're never like, oh, why are you letting this stuff happen to me? At least I never heard them say that. I never saw that. And I truly don't think they ever thought that. I really don't because that's just not who they are. And maybe, okay, maybe that thought crept into their mind, which, okay. I know I've had that thought creep into my mind like, yeah. God, why, why are you letting this happen to me right now? But you quickly dismiss that. And what I saw from my parents was hard work, integrity, honesty, being thankful for what you, I mean, there's so many times I think why I like just driving, I like I'll, Hey, if I could fly to a gig or drive to a gig and it's somewhat the same amount of travel time, I yeah. will pick driving all day long. Really? 100%, 100% because I like driving and also I have more control. Like I'm not oh, worried. Sure. I'm not yeah, worried yeah. about the airlines, a flight getting delayed, dealing with idiots in the airport. Right. Like, hey, we land and now we have to sit here for 45 minutes before we get an open gate, and then dealing with the rental car checkout. Like, I don't. I just drive and get my miles reimbursed, or I rent a car here in Dallas. And I drive <laughs> and I drop it off, and we're good. Yeah, I do that because one that it allows me to have more control to make sure that I am able to get to a gig and do what we do. Right. I mean, I've driven literally through the night before to make it sure I got to a gig. Cody yeah. just did it the other day, drove nine hours through the night Good grief! to show up and make sure he was at a gig on time because we've never missed a gig at Echelon Front. No one's yeah. been late. No one's missed one. That's impressive. I've driven through the night multiple times where it's like, okay, you can't get me to my city. What's the closest city? <sighs> Check. Yeah. You fly there, you land, get a rental car, and then literally just drive through the night. And, and you get to implement some of that tactical driving stuff during uh, Allegedly. During <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> You know, you see the the time on the GPS and you're like, challenge accepted. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, and it's just like, I think that comes again from just the environment that my parents created for us. So like, right. hey, you know what? We're going to drive up to Lake Tahoe. I grew up in Sacramento and we go up to Lake Tahoe and it would be like an hour and a half, two hour drive. And we just drive up there as a family listening to like the Beach Boys or some different oldies music or praise and worship. That's all our family listened to was either yeah. praise and worship or oldies. And it was awesome. Again, great foundation to yeah, be raised yeah. on. And we would just, you know, talk. And it was it was cool. It was a lot of cool memories. And I, I, that's what I like being able to do with my family and, and us being able to do the same thing, which I'm, again, thankful my parents, you know, set that foundation in us. Yeah, man. Yeah. And I know my brother Corey does the same thing. Like, bro, that guy will just drive just to drive. I'm like, dude, I can get you a flight. He's like, no, no, that's a waste of money. I'm like, no, it's not. Like, I can get you here and it's a three hour flight. He's like, yeah, but I could drive there in 19 hours. I'm like, it's a. Yeah, that's like some Scott Steiner math. I'm like, bro, I have points. Like, it, yeah. it costs me nothing. I have points. He's like, no, 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 I'll drive. And I'm like, all right. And we're like, whatever. Yeah. He's a he's a road warrior, man. That's it. That's wild. Like 19 hours is a long time to be in a car. He'll do it. No factor. It's disgusting to me. But I also say that, and I've had to do it before. Right. We had an FTX coming up. Um, 
uh, not coming up like recently. Like this was right, like right. back in 2018. And I get to the airport with all of our gear. We have, you know, so the FTX is all of our field training exercise. It's all of our hands-on scenario-based leadership training. Yeah. And actually this next week, um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we have one day versions of these trainings. And usually we okay. do for individuals and small groups to sign up like the muster. It was mm-hmm. two day events of two full days of all the scenario based leadership training with these high speed laser tag systems That's that we have. So sick. The role players that you're going up against are uh, current and former SEALs, Marines, Rangers, Delta, SWAT guys, firefighter. I mean, it's we bring yeah. in good role players, um, not just to crush you with the tactics, but to be able to actually do the scenarios the way they're designed so that we can dictate the training of the leadership principles that we teach at Echelon Front. So every run, yes, it's going to be fun. Yes, there's some tactics involved. We actually don't teach tactics. We don't care about the tactics, but we focus on the hands-on development of these principles. Right. And so it's all of our field training exercises. And so this next week coming up, we have one day versions of those and those are all sold out. Except for Monday, we had a client that had to shift around. We have like two spots left, but Wednesday and Friday are sold out right now. And, um, anyway, so we're getting ready to go do our first one. And the guy that I bought all these laser tags from taggers from Mm -hmm. was like, yeah, you can absolutely travel with them. I'm like, cool. All right. So I go to the airport and I have four huge rolling 511 duffel bags, like full of all these taggers and these gear. Yeah. And then my personal bag. And it's like, I mean, it's so big and awkward. Like people are trying to help me get off the shuttle with all the bags and all the craziness. And, um, like I just had them like literally stacked on top of each other. Uh, I would have two of them on each side. And then my personal bag was like right. on top of one. And it's just like a straight, like <laughs> gut check, just a straight <laughs> gut check, trying to get it to the, and I couldn't find any of the carts to stack them on. Right. I get up the counter, we're going there, we're checking the bag. I got there three hours early because I knew with these laser tag systems, there's, there's going to be, be an something. issue. Right. Yeah. And, uh, bro, talk about the power of detachment, which we teach at Echelon Front. Detachment yep. is a superpower. Yeah. <laughs> bro i get there and this lady was like do the you know she's like you can't fly with these i'm like they're prop laser tag guns why not like you can fly with regular weapons she's like well the batteries i'm like the batteries are the, it's not gonna be a battery issue like photographers and people travel with their batteries all the time yeah, for other stuff every like cell phone like cell phones and power tools and like people that drive and i know there are people that with larger batteries total like if you're looking yeah. you know and she just would not budge off of it and her supervisor. And again, it, it comes to like incompetence on their end of yeah. actually understanding. And I'm literally now diving into all the like things, like showing them. I'm like, Hey, this is what your guys is. This is what it says. Like yeah, you can your fly, policy. you can actually fly yeah. with these things. And they just, they're like, no, because I failed to communicate to them their own policy properly. They were not budging with it. Wow. And I was getting like frustrated. Yeah. To the, now, and I'll, I'm I'm pretty observant. I'm like looking around. I'm frustrated. I'm sitting there. I'm like trying to talk. And then I see this cop show up and he's like standing off to the side. I'm like, great, dude. You <laughs> kidding me? Like you freaking call the cops, man. Like I'm not even being aggressive. Like I'm just frustrated trying to explain this stuff. Yeah. And then another cop shows up on my other side. And I'm like, <laughs> good God. Come on, guys. And then another i'm like hey can you please get your manager like i need to talk to you know and so it's like now that's the supervisor's manager and yeah not budging on it and i'm like okay and again this is why we have an sop at echelon front we don't travel the day of or the day right before Mm -hmm. when we have these big things whoever's going to be taking care of the gear it's two to three days early yeah because you got to make sure you have the gear set up if we don't have the gear we can't train yeah we take preemptive ownership over things that we know that problems are going to happen and so I'm literally traveling a full complete day ahead of everybody else. And I'm like, okay, all right. Like, they're not going to let me fly. I'm not, I, I can't win this battle. And what, what, what good is going to come? Me ending up on a no fly list because I lose my temper. Right. And I'm, or them intentionally losing your bags. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so I, uh, I got on our, our app for travel and I booked a rental car and I booked a minivan and I grabbed the bags and. I walked off, frustrated, mad, got on the shuttle, went and got a minivan, sat down, all, folded all the seats flat, loaded all the gear in there, and drove 18 and a half hours straight. Good grief, dude. Because that, yeah, was, the only, that was the only option. Yeah. And uh, I remember I was pulling into town about 30 minutes before the first flight was showing up. <laughs> 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 and I'm just like running on fumes, man. 
Yeah. And um, But you made it. I made it, and we set everything up, got the drone up, got pictures of the play field, developed the battle maps, came up with the scenarios. Then all the instructors showed up, and the next day we ran a full day of training. And, oh, oh by the way, that night I was up until 4 in the morning working on all the gear and all the stuff by because i was the only one that knew how to work on all this stuff yeah this was the very first one i hadn't had the opportunity to teach anybody anything yet yeah and so i was up literally until four in the morning working on everything alarm went off at 4 45 so i had 45 minutes of sleep and then i'm getting all the gear loaded up we go do the training we're trying to get everything set up uh and it was just kind of I was doing everything and it was cool because I saw like Jocko comes over. He's like, Hey JP, what do we need to be doing? Yeah. Just tell us what you need to do and we'll figure it out. And I'm like, okay. And I just like, boom, 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 boom. And then guys just started doing all their tasks. And it was, you know, it was a good example for him coming in and helping me detach from doing all the work and mm-hmm. just saying, Hey, give us broad directions. And that's what yeah. I did. Gave the guys broad directions. We did the full day of training, loaded up the gear and I started driving home. Now, I did stop halfway because at this point I'm running and I just was like, okay, I can go for a while without sleep. Well, I mean, a couple of years ago, I could definitely do a lot longer than I can now. It's definitely taken its toll over the years. I'm still smart about it. I'll do what I need to do. But, you know, I I remember I got like halfway and I was like, I've I've got to shut it down for a couple hours. Yeah. I got a hotel and shut it down and then came home and it was good, man. But, uh, yeah, no matter what, we get the work done. Yeah, for and sure. It's just something that I, I and and here's the deal. We love what we do at Echelon Front. Yeah. Like Cody Gandy loves what he does and he's such a stud. He's taken over that whole program for me. And so he now he runs that program and all of our other instructors, Danny Zeem, who helps us with that, Justin, he's not an instructor but he's uh, uh helps work all the logistics. Uh, of everything that we do for all the FTXs and all of our first responder training. And, you know, we're, you know, Leif and I had a call the other day. We're building out, a, we're, we're going to build out our own Echelon Front training facilities where people can come to us for That's classroom cool. instruction and, you know, different types of events that we run. And it's just, man, I'm super thankful for what we get to do at Echelon Front. So it's pretty rad. So we'll definitely be talking a lot about that. Yeah, um, yeah. What got you into being a pastor, man? Oh, dude. So I, 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 we have to we have okay. to share with our guests at least a Cliff right. Notes version of that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so the short story is is this: like I felt the call into ministry when I was fourteen. I was at a youth camp. Um, our our house had just burned down the year before, and uh, well, I guess uh, just a few months before. So, and that would have been in January of two thousand. Our house burned down at fourteen years old. Jeez. Um, I had just bought my very first bass guitar, which is what I wanted to play since I was a little kid, and uh, you know later in my story. Uh, I get to do it professionally. Did it for professionally for about a decade. Had a blast doing it. Got to play with a bunch of like um, national and and some big like worldwide acts. It was a, it was a ton of fun. Wow. So we we have our house burned down. Uh, I'm at a youth camp. My uh, my parents um, just because of the church that we were in, they were connected with some people who like really really wanted to show. I'm the oldest of four, so they wanted to show the kids like a good time over the summer that we were working out logistics, trying to find a place to live and still kind of bouncing back and forth between our grandparents' house and like trying to find a rental property for, you know, a few months afterwards. So they decided they were going to sponsor me to go to youth camp. It was my first youth camp ever. Uh, we have this, this incredible night of worship. There's this big bonfire. And then the guy who's leading it was like, Hey, if, uh, you know, if anybody feels led to, to share their testimony or share a word, you know, like now, you know, now's the time it kind of opened it up. And I'm, I'm one of the youngest kids there, but nobody's doing anything. Like nobody's hmm. saying anything. And I just really feel like the Holy Spirit's like pushing me to say something. I'm like, no, I'm at, first off. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not even like the size of a popcorn fart. Like I'm this little bitty kid. Right. And I'm like, I'm not going to go up there and talk. This is not my thing. Um, I want to play music. I don't want to talk to people. Uh, I, w- I want to hang out and be funny, but I don't want to want to have to be serious. And so another couple of moments goes by and I just really feel like mm-hmm. the the Holy Spirit's just like pushing me like you need to go share your testimony awesome. so finally I, I do it um, and then immediately you know after I get done um, you know as so people come up to me and they're like wow that's really powerful you know thanks for sharing all that about how God's grace like not just like saved us from the house fire because everybody survived but yeah. also like the next day we went through the house 
then all the like the walls would be gone and like a stu- there would be one stud in the middle of a wall that was like burnt up and that stud would be holding up like one of the pictures of scripture that my mom had in the house what? or like pictures of the family like the entire room would be gone on both sides of this one like crispy stud and then there would be the only shelf that uh, you know survived in our den was the one that had our bibles on it we took the last bible off of it and like the whole shelf and that whole wall like falls into the garage so so I'm sharing that stuff and it was this like incredible wow. thing holy cow and so that's where I really felt like, okay, God wants me to do something different and, you know, with my life, something into ministry. Uh, and I always thought it was going to be music. So I pursue music, um, get, so that happened when I was 14 at 15, I got my very first studio gig with a songwriter for Leanne Rhymes. um, was a, a guy that, you know, went to our church. He saw what I was doing. He cuts hair and like has all of his platinum records in his hair salon it's like he's just like this really unassuming like super sweet dude awesome. and uh yeah and he, he's cut hair since he was a kid so you go in there and he's got all leanne rhymes platinum records around there and some of the other ones he's written on and you're like what are you doing cutting hair he's like i love it this is my favorite thing to do so i like writing songs on the side so that's what he does uh but he, but he he called me and was like hey um you know, I've seen you play a couple of times at church. I think you got some talent. I got a small studio. And so my parents would take me to the studio uh, because I was 15. I couldn't drive. They would take me to the yeah. studio, drop me off with Ron for a few hours. I'd, I'd crank out a bunch of stuff. And then mom and dad would have to come pick me up at like two or three in the morning, whenever they were, you know, still having to go get ready for work. That's they're so like, crazy. Yeah. So it was, it was really wild. Well, um, I ended up, you know, kind of we're doing the Cliff Notes version of it. So I ended up playing bass professionally, doing it with some worship bands, spent some time as a missionary, as a uh, kind of a, a road manager for a group of evangelists that were like former athletes. Uh, there was a group called Team Impact. That's where I met Isaac's dad. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was like on the road. I was his boss, but I was really like just a peon. So, but it was a ton of fun getting to hang out with all of those guys and, and getting to experience that in ministry. Well, when I, I get done, I go to Canada. I'm a missionary in Canada for a year. I get done with that. I've I kind of experienced what ministry could be like in a, in a really different way than how we do it in the States. Mm-hmm. Spent a couple of months over in the UK, um, primarily in Scotland, working with some denominations that I hadn't really been familiar with uh, before, like the Anglican Church and some folks like that. Mm. And, and they just had a different way of doing church. And so when I get home and church is all like bright lights and fog machines, I was like, I hate this. <laughs> like I... I was yeah. like, you know what, God, you're just going to have to do some work on my heart to get me back to where I'm not comparing the church back home versus the church that I, I saw when I was away and like mm. commitment levels and, and things like that. And so uh, I spent a lot of time working myself out of debt. I was working at Starbucks. I would get to work at 4.30. And, well, I was supposed to be there at 4.30. I'd show up like 4.35, 4.38. But I had some great managers that like showed me grace and they would clock me in. <laughs> They're like, hey, yeah, bro. They would like edit the time. Come They're like, on, knucklehead. Yeah, figure it out. But, uh, but no, so I'd, I'd work at Starbucks from like 4.30 in the morning until like 10.30, uh, five or six days a week. And then I would go from there to a job at Discount Tire. And after that, um, would get off from Discount Tire and then I'd moonlight at a Harley shop. So I was doing all of that stuff and uh, a pastor of mine. You can make um, excuses or you can make yeah, things you can happen. Make things happen. You can't right? do both. So like you're you're talking about that and I was like, yeah, I know that you know, that that feeling. And so I was working myself out of debt and and when um, I got a call from a, a buddy of mine and he was like, hey, I need you to lead worship uh, for my youth group. And I, I was like, for you know, he's like on Wednesday nights. It's like, all right, well, I'm, I'm sure I can ask for the time off. He goes, it's fifty bucks you know, a night if you want to do it. And I was like, cool, but I, I will only do it if you have the check ready for me whenever I show up. <laughs> and that's just like the attitude that I had, which was a terrible attitude. To yeah. Have. But over, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, eh. that's, that's just, that's where I was. Yeah. And, uh, over the course of a couple of months, like God really softened my heart through like his ministry. And the first couple of times I led worship and then I was like, got the check. And then I took off, didn't stay for his message. Didn't stay to hang out with the kids. Like nothing. Yeah. I was yeah. there to, to play music and I was done. Um, and God, like I said, God really softened my heart. I got to build some relationships with some of his leaders and, and that's kind of how God, you know, and the Holy Spirit, like pulled me back into, mm-hmm. you know, the, the calling that was on my life. And then I got a call from, uh, my pastor, uh, who was my pastor growing up. Um, he had retired and was doing an interim pastorship at, a, at this church right now, this small little that's crazy. church, like in a small community. And he was like, you know, there's like 30 people here and 12 of them are youth kids you know, will you just come and like help me out, like teach a Sunday school lesson? So I did, and I I was convinced that this was all it was going to be. I'm just going to teach one Sunday school lesson as a favor to Ben, and then I'm going to be done. Yeah. And as soon as we're done, you know, Dr. Smith pulls me aside and he's like, hey, I think you're supposed to do this. I think you're supposed to be our youth minister. And I was like, that's really nice, old man. Like, 
<laughs> like what's you know he's like well you at least go to lunch and talk with me about it i was like hey, sh- why not right uh, as long as you're paying right still yeah, like, still I, like that's my mentality um but i you know i i fell in love with the kids because they were just a bunch of uh they were students who were really like looking for where their place was going to be and so i felt connected to them because i was kind of doing the same awesome. thing at the time and uh you know a couple of years later, um, he is retiring from full-time pastorship, and uh, we put together a pastoral search committee, and they're like, hey, would you want to be interviewed? It's like, if, if you guys want me to, I got like, no aspirations for this. And so <laughs> we were in the interview, and they, by, my favorite thing is I had, uh, had already been questioned about, like, because I was single at the time wasn't really dating look a lot like I do now like mm-hmm. long hair beard was doing a lot of things that they didn't really understand yeah and so you know I spent a lot of time at, at home like I'm a Star Wars geek and all that and they're like all right so in the the pastoral interview they're asking me they're like so are you are you gay it's like what are you <laughs> you guys have known me for like five years you know like and they're like well we never we never heard it you know whether or not you're seeing anybody or anything like that and I was like right because like that was, oh like some other gosh, people, and then they bro. asked me like the the follow up when I say no, you know I'm I'm not same sex attracted. They're like, does that mean that you're not same sex attracted or that you're just non practicing? And I was like, you guys are like trying to set bear traps for me. What? So and like these are these are leaders that I knew and now like continue to be great leaders within our church. And it was just you know due diligence, right? So um, I was like, <laughs> no. And now I'm married and we've got a, a kid and another on the way. But it's just oh one of those gosh. things that like God's grace is just showing up so much because like I didn't even bat an eye at those questions. Yeah. Where like normally uh, you would you know be like, what the heck are you talking about, yeah. right? But um, then they they say, hey, you know what? We we want you for this position. I was like, okay. So we we talked a little bit about it. I was a thirty, um, so I'm mm. young. I'm yeah. single. That's a dangerous spot for a church to be in um, hmm. because there's a lot of opportunity for pastoral failing. Yeah. in that spot. Yeah, right? that actually that makes so, a lot of sense. Yes. Um, so we were talking about it and, and kind of figuring out how to approach it. And then my pastor, uh, he has a heart attack. So he's fine now, but uh, he has a heart attack. He's going to have a quadruple bypass. He was losing oxygen to his brain, which kind of, he felt like he was missing a step, which is why he decided that he wanted to step down from ministry. Well, he didn't have all the oxygen to his brain that he needed. That's Mm -hmm. why he was, he was kind of slowing down. And so prior to like his official retirement and to the church, you know, coming together and voting on like, Hey, do we want this guy to be a pastor or not? Um, I ran the church for 90 days. Like I was the associate pastor at that time and kind of just stepped into the role. And so, uh, God used that opportunity as a way to, and this was still like my fourth job. So God used that as an opportunity to, uh, get him healed and healthy, to get him the help that he needed so that he could continue to function. And he's our pastor emeritus now. He still preaches for us several times a year and mm-hmm. does a lot of pulpit supply for other churches, uh, but also to give the congregation the confidence, like, now this 30-year-old kid can, can do it. I had 90 days where I was in the role before they ever tried yeah. to figure out whether or not it was something I I could do. You know, we kind of, God put me in the position where I, where I could do it. And then that was... Uh, into 2016, beginning in 2017, and February 5th, 2017 was my my first day officially as pastor. I got to to quit the other gigs. Um, the wow. church was like, "Hey, we want to we want this to be your focal point and to provide this." And so, um, you know, God just kind of opened up all those doors, and uh, kind of the rest is history. About uh, that's rad. A year and a half later, um, I was uh, getting engaged, and now here we are, happily married with yeah, insane. Be- beautiful, it's just yeah, beautiful yeah, one, baby, and one on the one way. One on the man. way, man. Let's go. It's it's nuts, but it's, it's never crazy, like looking it's back awesome. six years ago. Whenever I accepted the role as pastor, I was still like, all right, this is what I'm going to do for now. And now looking at it, and and where my where I really feel like the Holy Spirit is leading me, like this is this is it. I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do. It's the hardest job I've ever had, but it's the it's the best. I'm having the most fun I've ever had. It's really yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, that's rad, man. Um, you know, if you guys are if you guys are listening. You can find us on social media. I'm at JP Donnell. So that's J P D I N N E L L. Um, we're going to have this up on iTunes, on Spotify. We're going to have it on YouTube. If you guys can subscribe, like, comment, that definitely helps us out. Uh, Lucas, where can they find you if you want them to find you? 
Boy, I don't know if I want them to find out. <laughs> yeah. They're going to no matter yeah, what. Yeah. No, I'm I'm at Lucas Pinkard, and that is uh, L U C A S P I N C K A R D. The C and the K are tricky, man. I, like I think this is a good spot for us to wrap it up for the yeah. first one, and looking forward to doing more um, with you and as we bring on guests and. Yeah, I'm just I'm very thankful for this opportunity that we both have to do this. Me too, I know man. it's going to be awesome. Be it's going to be a blessing, and uh, I'm thankful that like our lives are intertwined now because you know I think it's 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 an amazing opportunity that we both have. And you know I have this bracelet that I wear that has you know the names of my fallen teammates, you know guys that died in combat and training and and from cancer in the most recent years. And you know on the inside it says "Live to honor them," mm. and you know, as I'm listening to you tell that story and I think about all the things that I've gotten to do and there's all these things that you've gotten to do in your life that I don't even know about, but I know somebody helped you along the way, like yeah. they've helped me along the way. And I think about my fallen teammates and yeah, it's a, it's an easy, broad statement to have live to honor them. Right. And it sounds cool, but you know, that's one of the things that I know that I get to do because of what I do with echelon front and also Like, I really want this podcast <clears throat> to be an honor to them as well. Yeah. So that we can share their stories and, you know, honor their lives and their legacy so that, that we never fail them. And I remember when Seth passed away, I was standing watch over him in the funeral home. And at the very end of that time, Jocko and Leif walked up and, um, Everyone kind of gave us our time in there with Seth. And it was just the three of us. And um, Leif put some uh, surf wax in the casket. It was the same surf wax that him and Seth used to use all the time when they would surf together in San Diego. And I took off the other bracelet that I had with other teammates' names that were engraved on it. And I placed it in the casket. And I remember looking at him laying there. And he just... Seth was always that just big brother to me. And I remember when, when I got the call from Leif that Seth passed away, it was, it was devastating. It ruined, like literally ruined my, my world at that moment. But it, it never fully sank in until I, I was looking at Seth and I, and I touched his chest for the last time. You know, when I put my hand on his chest and I said goodbye to him, and then Jocko comes up and presents him with his black belt. You know, Seth did jiu-jitsu just like we all do. And Jocko presents him with his with his black belt. And he's sitting there and he's thinking and he pauses and he he just simply says, We're not gonna fail him. And we're not gonna fail all of them. The rest of our teammates. You know, that's who he's talking about. And he said, Because they never failed us. Seth never failed us. We're not going to fail them. And I, I, you know, I get to share that story at the muster and I, I try to share that with people. And it's something I just want us to all think about of just how do we live our lives to honor them so that we don't fail them. And you don't have to live your life to honor a fallen service member. You may not know one. You may not be connected to one. But there's somebody out there that sacrificed something so that you can have what you have right now. Somebody poured into you and it's our opportunity to take this gift that God has given us, which is time. The fact that we're breathing, the fact that we're alive, the fact that we, we get to go pick up our kids and we get to sit in traffic and go to work. We get to go. All the things that we get to do has been given to us as a gift. And I just want us to remember to live our lives, to honor them and that we will not fail. With that, this has been episode one. Thank you.